Volume 1, Book 1, Chapters 10 through 19 of The Life of Apollonius of Tyana. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Apollonius of Tyana by Flavius Philostratus, translated by F. C. Conybeare. Volume 1, Book 1. Chapter 10 one day he saw a flood of blood upon the altar and there were victims laid out upon it egyptian bulls that had been sacrificed and great hogs and some of them were being flayed and others were being cut up and two gold vases had been dedicated set with jewels the rarest and most beautiful that india can provide so he went up to the priest and said what is all this for some one is making a very handsome gift to the gods and the priest replied you may rather be surprised at a man's offering all this without having first put up a prayer in our fane and without having stayed with us as long as other people do and without having gained his health from the god and without obtaining all the things he came to ask for here for he appears to have come only yesterday and yet he is sacrificing on this lavish scale and he declares that he will sacrifice more victims and dedicate more gifts if esculapius will hearken to him and he is one of the richest men in existence at any rate he owns in cilicia an estate bigger than all the cilicians together possess and he is supplicating the god to restore to him one of his eyes that has fallen out but Apollonius fixed his eyes upon the ground, as he was accustomed to do in later life, and asked, What is his name? And when he heard it, he said, It seems to me, O priest, that we ought not to welcome this fellow in the temple, for he is some ruffian who has come here, and that he is afflicted in this way is due to some sinister reason. Nay, his very conduct in sacrificing on such a magnificent scale before he has gained anything from the god is not that of a genuine votary but rather of a man who is begging himself off from the penalty of some horrible and cruel deeds this was what apollonius said and asclepius appeared to the priest by night and said send away so and so at once and with all his possessions and let him keep them for he deserves to lose the other eye as well the priest accordingly made inquiries about the cilician and learned that his wife had by a former marriage borne a daughter and he had fallen in love with the maiden and had seduced her and was living with her in open sin for the mother had surprised the two in bed and had put out both her eyes and one of his by stabbing them with her brooch pin chapter eleven again he inculcated the wise rule that in our sacrifices or dedications we should not go beyond the just mean in the following way on one occasion several people had flocked to the temple not long after the expulsion of the cilician and he took the occasion to ask the priest the following questions he said are then the gods just answered the priest why of course most just well and are they wise said the other and what can be wiser than the godhead but do they know the affairs of men or are they without experience of them said the other why this is just the point in which the gods excel mankind for the latter because of their frailty do not understand their own concerns whereas the gods have the privilege of understanding the affairs both of men and of themselves apollonius said all of your answers are excellent o priest and very true since then they know everything it appears to me that a person who comes to the house of god and has a good conscience should put up the following prayer o ye gods grant unto me that which i deserve for the holy o priest surely deserve to receive blessings and the wicked the contrary therefore the gods as they are beneficent if they find any one who is healthy and whole and unscarred by vice will send him away surely after crowning him not with golden crowns but with all sorts of blessings 
and if they find a man branded with sin and utterly corrupt, they will hand him over and leave him to justice, after inflicting their wrath upon him all the more, because he dared to invade their temples without being pure. And at the same moment he looked toward Asclepius and said, O Asclepius, the philosophy you teach is secret and congenial to yourself in that you suffer not the wicked to come hither, not even if they pour into your lap all the wealth of India and Sardis. For it is not out of reverence for the divinity that they sacrifice these victims and kindle these fires, but in order to purchase a verdict which you will not concede to them in your perfect justice. And much similar wisdom he delivered himself of in this temple while he was still a youth. Chapter 12 this tale also belongs to the period of his residence at Aige. Cilicia was governed at the time by a ruffian addicted to infamous forms of passion. No sooner did he hear the beauty of Apollonius spoken of, than he cast aside the matters he was busy upon, and he was just then holding a court at Tarsus. And hurrying off to Aige, pretended he was sick, and must have the help of Asclepius. There he came upon Apollonius walking alone, and prayed himself to recommend him to the god. But he replied, What recommendation can you want from any one if you are good? For the gods love men of virtue, and welcome them without any introductions. Said the other, Because, to be sure, the god, O Apollonius, has invited you to be his guest, but so far has not invited me. Answered Apollonius, Nay, tis my humble merits so far as a young man can display good qualities which have been my passport to the favour of asclepius whose servant and companion i am if you too really care for goodness go boldly up to the god and tender what prayer you will said the other by heaven i will if you will allow me to address you one first apollonius said and what prayer can you make to me? A prayer which can only be offered to the beautiful, and which is that they may grant to others participation in their beauty, and not grudge their charms. This he said with a vile leer and voluptuous air, and all the usual wriggles of such infamous debauches. But Apollonius, with a stern, fierce glance at him, said, You are mad, you scum! The other not only flamed up at these words, but threatened to cut off his head, whereat Apollonius laughed at him and cried out loud, Ha! That day is to come. And in fact, it was only three days later that the ruffian was executed by the officers of justice on the high road for having intrigued with Archelaus the king of Cappadocia against the Romans. These and many similar incidents are given by Maximus of Aige in his treatise, a writer whose reputation for oratory won him a position in the emperor's secretariat. Chapter 13 Now when he heard that his father was dead, he hurried to Tyana, and with his own hands buried him hard by his mother's sepulchre, for she too had died not long before and he divided the property which was very ample with his brother who was an incorrigibly bad character and given to drink now the latter had reached his twenty-third year and was of an age no longer to need a guardian apollonius on the other hand was only twenty and the law subjected him to guardians he therefore spent afresh some time in Aige and turned the temple into a lyceum and academy for it resounded with all sorts of philosophical discussions after that he returned to tyana by this time grown to manhood and his own master some one said to him that it was his duty to correct his brother and convert him from his evil ways whereon he answered this would seem a bold enterprise for how can i who am the younger one correct and render wise an older man but so far as I can do anything, I will heal him of these bad passions. Accordingly, he gave to him the half of his own share of the property, on the pretense that he required more than he had, while he himself needed little, 
and then he pressed him and cleverly persuaded him to submit to the counsels of wisdom and said our father has departed this life who educated us both and corrected us so that you are all that i have left and i imagine i am all that you have left if therefore i do anything wrong please advise me and cure me of my faults and in turn if you yourself do anything wrong suffer me to teach you better and so he reduced his brother to a reasonable state of mind just as we break in skittish and unruly horses by stroking and patting them and he reformed him from his faults numerous as they were for he was the slave of play and of wine and he led a riotous life and was vain of his hair which he dressed up and dyed strutting about like an arrogant dandy so when all was well between him and his brother he at once turned his attention to his other relatives and consolated such of them as were in want by bestowing on them the rest of his property leaving only a trifle to himself for he said that anaxagoras of clazomenae kept his philosophy for cattle rather than for men when he abandoned his fields to flocks and goats and that of crates of thebes when he threw his money into the sea benefited neither man nor beast and as pythagoras was celebrated for his saying that a man should have no intercourse except with his own wife he declared that this was intended by pythagoras for others than himself for that he was resolved never to wed nor have any connection whatever with women in laying such restraint on himself he surpassed sophocles who only said that in reaching old age he had escaped from a mad and cruel master but apollonius by dint of virtue and temperance never even in his youth was so overcome while still a mere stripling in full enjoyment of his bodily vigour he mastered and gained control of the maddening passion and yet there are those who accuse him falsely of an addiction to venery alleging that he fell a victim of such sins and spent a whole year in their indulgence among the scythians the facts being that he never once visited scythia nor was ever carried away by such passions not even euphrates ever accused the sage of venery though he traduced him otherwise and composed lying treatises against him as we shall show when we come to speak of him below and his quarrel with apollonius was that the latter rallied him for doing everything for money and tried to wean him of his love of filthy lucre and of huckstering his wisdom but these matters i must defer to the times to which they belong chapter fourteen on one occasion euxenus asked apollonius why so noble a thinker as he and one who was master of a diction so fine and nervous did not write a book he replied i have not yet kept silence and forthwith he began to hold his tongue from a sense of duty and kept absolute silence though his eyes and his mind were taking note of many a thing and though most things were being stored in his memory indeed when he reached the age of a hundred he still surpassed simonides in point of memory and he used to chant a hymn addressed to memory in which it is said that everything is worn and withered away by time whereas time itself never ages but remains immortal because of memory nevertheless his company was not without charm during the period of his silence for he would maintain a conversation by the expression of his eyes by gestures of his hand and nodding his head nor did he strike men as gloomy or morose for he retained his fondness for company and his cheerfulness this part of his life he says was still the most uphill work he knew since he practised silence for five whole years for he says he often had things to say and could not do so and he was often obliged not to hear things the hearing of which would have enraged him and often when he was moved and inclined to break out in rebuke to others he said to himself bear up then my heart and tongue and when reasoning offended him he had to give up for the time the refuting of it chapter fifteen 
these years of silence he spent partly in pamphylia and partly in cilicia and though his paths lay through such effeminate races as these he never spoke nor was even induced to murmur whenever however he came on a city engaged in civil conflict and many were divided into factions over spectacles of a low kind he would advance and show himself and by indicating part of his intended rebuke by manual gesture or by look on his face he would put an end to all the disorder and people hushed their voices as if they were engaged in the mysteries well it is not so very difficult to restrain those who have started a quarrel about dances and horses for those who are rioting about such matters if they turn their eyes to a real man blush and check themselves and easily recover their senses but a city hard pressed by famine is not so tractable nor so easily brought to a better mood by persuasive words and its passion quelled but in the case of apollonius mere silence on his part was enough for those so afflicted anyhow when he came to aspendus in pamphylia and this city is built on the river Eurymedon along with two others he found nothing but vetch on sale in the market and the citizens were feeding upon this and on anything else they could get for the rich men had shut up all the corn and were holding it up for export from the country consequently an excited crowd of all ages had set upon the governor and were lighting a fire to burn him alive although he was clinging to the statues of the emperor which were more dreaded at that time and more inviolable than the zeus in olympia for they were statues of tiberius in whose reign a master is said to have been held guilty of impiety merely because he struck his own slave when he had on his person a silver drachma coined with the image of tiberius apollonius then went up to the governor and with a sign of his hand asked him what was the matter and he answered that he had done no wrong but was indeed being wronged quite as much as the populace but he said if he could not get a hearing he would perish along with the populace apollonius then turned to the bystanders and beckoned to them that they must listen and they not only held their tongues from wonderment at him but they laid the fire they had kindled on the altars which were there the governor then plucked up the courage and said this man and that man and he named several are to blame for the famine which has arisen and they have taken away the corn and are keeping it one in one part of the country and another in another the inhabitants of aspendus thereupon passed the word to one another to make for these men's estates but apollonius signed with his head that they should do no such thing but rather summon those who were to blame and obtain the corn from them with their consent and when after a little time the guilty parties arrived he very nearly broke out in speech against them so much was he affected by the tears of the crowd for the children and women had all flocked together and the old men were groaning and moaning as if they were on the point of dying by hunger however he respected his vow of silence and wrote on a writing-board his indictment of the offenders and handed it to the governor to read out aloud and his indictment ran as follows apollonius to the corn dealers of aspendus the earth is mother of us all for she is just but you because you are unjust have pretended that she is your mother alone and if you do not stop i will not permit you to remain upon her they were so terrified by these words that they filled the market-place with corn and the city revived chapter sixteen after the term of his silence was over he also visited the great antioch and passed into the temple of the apollo of daphne to which the assyrians attach the legend of arcadia for they say that daphne the daughter of ladon there underwent her metamorphosis and they have a river flowing there the ladon and a laurel tree is worshipped by them which they say was substituted for the maiden and cypress trees of enormous height surround the temple and the ground sends up springs both ample and placid in which they say apollo purified himself by ablution 
and there it is that the earth sends up a shoot of cypress they say in honour of cyparisus an assyrian youth and the beauty of the shrub lends credence to the story of his metamorphosis well i perhaps may seem to have fallen into a somewhat juvenile vein to approach my story by such legendary particulars as these but my interest is not really in mythology what then is the purport of my narrative apollonius when he beheld a temple so graceful and yet the home of no serious studies but only of men half barbarous and uncultivated remarked o oh, apollo change these dumb dogs into trees so that at least as cypresses they may become vocal and when he had inspected the springs and noted how calm and quiet they were and how not one of them made the least babble he remarked the prevailing dumbness of this place does not permit even the springs to speak and when he saw the ladon he said it is not your daughter alone that underwent a change but you too so far as one can see have become a barbarian after being a helen and an arcadian and when he was minded to converse he avoided the frequented regions and the disorderly and said that it was not a rabble he wanted but real men and he resorted to the more solemn places and lived in such temples as were not shut up at sunrise indeed he performed certain rites by himself rites which he only communicated to those who had disciplined themselves by a four years spell of silence but during the rest of the day in case the city was a greek one and the sacred rites familiar to him he would call the priests together and talk wisely about the gods and would correct them supposing that they had departed from the traditional forms if however the rites were barbarous and peculiar then he would find out who had founded them and on what occasion they were established and having learnt the sort of cult it was he would make suggestions in case he could think of any improvement upon them and then he would go in quest of his followers and bid them ask any questions they liked for he said that it was the duty of philosophers of his school to hold converse at the earliest dawn with the gods but as the day advanced about the gods and during the rest of the day to discuss human affairs in friendly intercourse and having answered all the questions which his companions addressed to him and when he had had enough of their society he would rise and give himself up for the rest of the day to the general public not however before midday but as far as possible just when the day stood still and when he thought he had had enough of such conversation he would be anointed and rubbed and then fling himself into cold water for he called hot baths the old age of men at any rate when the people of antioch were shut out of them because of the enormities committed there he said the emperor for your sins has granted you a new lease of life and when the ephesians wanted to stone their governor because he did not warm their baths enough he said to them you are blaming your governor because you get such a sorry bath but i blame you because you take a bath at all chapter seventeen the literary style which he cultivated was not dithyrambic or tumid and swollen with poetical words nor again was it far-fetched and full of affected atticisms for he thought that an excessive degree of atticizing was unpleasant neither did he indulge in subtleties or spin out his discourses nor did any one ever hear him disassembling in an ironical way nor addressing to his audience methodical arguments but when he conversed he would assume an oracular manner and use the expressions i know or it is my opinion or where are you drifting to or you must know and his sentences were short and crisp and his words were telling and closely fitted to the things he spoke of and his words had a ring about them as of the dooms delivered by a sceptred king and when a certain quibbler asked him why he asked no questions of him he replied because i asked questions when i was a stripling and it is not my business to ask questions now but to teach people what i have discovered the other asked him afresh 
how then o apollonius should a sage converse he replied like a lawgiver for it is the duty of the lawgiver to deliver to the many the instructions of whose truth he has persuaded himself this was the line he pursued during his stay in antioch and he converted to himself the most unrefined people chapter eighteen after this he formed the scheme of an extensive voyage and had in mind the indian race and the sages there who are called brahmans and hyrcanians for he said that it was a young man's duty to go abroad and to embark upon foreign travel but he made a great deal of the magi who live in babylon and susa for he said he was determined to acquaint himself thoroughly with their lore even if it cost him a journey and he announced his intention to his followers who were seven in number but when they tried to persuade him to adopt another plan in hopes of drawing him off from his resolution he said i have taken the gods into counsel and i have told you their decision and i have made trial of you to see if you are strong enough to undertake the same things as myself since therefore you are so soft and effeminate i wish you very good health that you may go on with your philosophy but i must depart whither wisdom and the gods lead me having said this he quitted antioch with two attendants who belonged to his father's house one of them a shorthand writer and the other a calligraphist chapter nineteen and he reached the ancient city of nineveh where he found an idol set up of barbarous aspect and it is they say io the daughter of inachus and horns short and as it were budding project from her temples while he was staying there and forming wiser conclusions about the image than could the priests and prophets one damis a native of nineveh joined him as a pupil the same as i said at the beginning who became the companion of his wanderings abroad and his fellow traveller and associate in all wisdom and who has preserved to us many particulars of the sage he admired him and having a taste for the road said let us depart o apollonius you following god and i you for i think you will find me of considerable value for if i know nothing else i have at least been to babylon and i know all the cities there are because i have been up there not long ago and also the villages in which there is much good to be found and moreover i know the languages of the various barbarous races and there are several for example the armenian tongue and that of the medes and persians and that of the natives of cadus and i am familiar with all of them apollonius said and i my good friend understand all languages though i never learnt a single one the native of nineveh was astonished at this answer but the other replied you need not wonder at my knowing all human languages for to tell you the truth i also understand all the secrets of human silence thereupon the assyrian worshipped him when he heard this and regarded him as a demon and he stayed with him increasing in wisdom and committing to memory whatever he learnt this assyrian's language however was of a mediocre quality for he had not the gift of expressing himself having been educated among the barbarians but he kept a journal of their intercourse and recorded in it whatever he heard or saw and he was very well able to put together a memoir of such matters and managed this better than any one else could do at any rate the volume which he calls his scrapbook was intended to serve such a purpose by damis who was determined that nothing about apollonius should be passed over in silence nay that his very solecisms and negligent utterances should also be written down and i may mention the answer which he made to one who cavilled and found fault with this journal it was a lazy fellow and malignant who tried to pick holes in him and remarked that he had recorded well enough a lot of things for example the opinions and ideas of his hero but that in collecting such trifles as these he reminded him of dogs who pick up and eat the fragments which fall from a feast damis replied thus if the banquets are those of gods and it is gods who are being fed surely 
they must have attendants whose business it is that not even the parcels of ambrosia that fall to the ground should be lost. End of Volume 1, Book 1, Chapters 10-19